Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. I had so much fun writing the script for my last video on these old videos from like the 40s, 50s, 60s that I just knew I wanted to make another and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's just jump straight into it because why not, right? First up we're starting with one that is not offensive at all, there's not really that much wrong with it, but it's just wonderfully and ridiculously melodramatic for something that is quite a mundane subject. I love it, this is wonderful, you're going to have a good giggle with this because I well, I did, so I'm sure you will too. This is 1947's Duties of a Secretary. <laughs> Seriously, it's just about how to be a secretary, but it's so dramatic, it's brilliant. You're lucky to get a good job like this, just out of school. I know. I only hope I can hold it. I've got a job. I've got a job, I've got a job. And the first week out of school, opened and sorted, and letters arranged for the employer's attention in the order of their relative imp It's important to remember never to interrupt dictation, since the dictator will lose his train of thought. Don't forget closure. Write down messages. Write them down. So it's about a woman who gets a job as a secretary and she dreams about her first day and how on that first day everything that can go wrong does go wrong. She makes all these mistakes, but it's so over the top. Give this a watch. Miss Hayes. Yes, Mr. Harmon? Didn't you hear me buzz? Bring your book for dictation. Yes, Mr. Harmon. Wayne. Is that L-A-U-R-E-L? -E yes. Where was I? Uh, at the corner of Valley Road and Laurel Lane. Oh, yes. He's unusually handsome, as you will see from the enclosed photograph. Enclose this with the letter. Yes, sir. I should be delighted to show the houses at your convenience. Looking forward to an opportunity to be of service. I remain very sincerely yours and so forth. Got that? Yes, sir. Do you want a new paragraph after convenience? Did I say paragraph? No, sir. Then no paragraph. That's all, Miss Hayes. Yes, sir. And closure. One of the most common types of carelessness is forgetting enclosures. I, I guess I forgot this. There should be a new paragraph. It's wrong. I'll just fix it anyway. These mistakes are like asking um, for like spelling of words, adding in an extra paragraph where there should be one, but he didn't say to do that. Oh my god. And this guy clearly in response, he has anger issues, right? And I know it's a dream guy, it's not real him. But like this guy in response, he clearly has anger issues, right? But Oh my god, the the music is so dramatic. It wouldn't be out of place in a horror film, would it? Just because she forgot to pick up a photo or she added in a paragraph. It's hilarious. I love it. Carelessness is the one unforgivable sin. I... 
I'm very sorry, Mr. Harmon. Carelessness is the one unforgivable sin. The one unforgivable sin. Prominent realtor was robbed last night of $20,000 in cash and many valuable papers. Mr. Harmon declares the loss is the fault of Barbara Hayes, his secretary, who is now in police custody pending arraignment. Extra, extra, Barbara Hayes accused of criminal negligence. Extra, Barbara Hayes sued for $50,000 damages. I know, I know. Forgetting to lock a safe isn't good, right? And if things get stolen, that's bad. But they really are trying to scare people into obedience, aren't they? I think my favourite one is the headline of, like, sentenced to 20 years hard labour for criminal negligence. <laughs> and just when you think it's got dramatic enough, it keeps going and going and going. It's brilliant. Seriously, this short film here would give the opening scenes of Psycho a run for their money. Oh, I love how ridiculous this is. It's fantastic and I just wanted to share it with you. It's brilliant. <laughs> Luckily, the woman wakes up, she goes into her first day and she does everything right and it's not at all like the dream and he's like, ah oh, yes, I'm sure you'll be my acquaintance for a long time. It's, it's all fine, it's good. That's all for today, Miss Hayes. Oh, uh, don't forget to lock up when you leave. No, sir. I, I hope everything is all right. Indeed it was. Just keep it up, and I'm sure our association will be a long and pleasant. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you see. Everything was fine. Good night, Miss Hayes. Good night, Mr. Hyman. I guess it does teach something. It's not particularly offensive. There's not really anything wrong with it. It's just I love how dramatic it is. It's ridiculous. And I want to share that with you guys. Next up, we're going to be looking at a very, very short one. This is only like a minute and a half, but this is uh, from 1934, and it's titled, What a Housewife Must Know. Housekeeping still remains the most important business of the world. It engages the hearts and minds of more people and calls for higher qualities than any other occupation. Each woman faces it single-handed. Oh... It's nice that you can acknowledge how much work it is. Now, if only you could see that this is something all adults should be doing and not just the women. She must know how to cook. No food. She must know how to set her table attractively. She must know how to make her home comfortable and inviting. Ignoring the little sound glitch here because, you know, these are old films, they've been digitised from actual, I think it's mostly like 60mm film and stuff like that. Um, I would make a terrible housewife. I really would. It's so funny, I get so many people in the comments telling me that like, oh, I just need to be a housewife, I need to settle down, give up YouTube, pop out some babies, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, I would be terrible at that. You have people like Classically Abby making videos about how, like one of her recent ones is about how everyone should be a mother, everyone should be a wife. If you just do it, you will find fulfillment in it. And remember, should they you know, take this giant step in their lives and actually approach parenthood, motherhood. Yes, you should be. I believe though, that motherhood is what life is for. Motherhood is a vocation worthy of respect more than not motherhood. You have your priorities wrong. You can't describe how love feels until you are carrying your own child. I don't like the idea that motherhood is a choice. 
it's ridiculous. I'm like, no, I know I won't. I know I'd be terrible at it. Why would I do something knowing it's gonna make me miserable and I'd be bad at it? Why would I give up a happy life and stuff that I'm good at for misery and inadequacy? Especially when that misery and inadequacy is gonna make other people miserable too, you know? If I have to look after a husband and kid and I'm bad at it, they're gonna suffer too, anyway. She must know the worth of labor-saving device and how best to conserve her time and energy. <laughs> Actually, so, oh, oh, okay, so I have mixed thoughts about this. On the one hand, I was like, oh, like something I'm actually good at. I love a good lazy hack around the house because trust me, I do. But then I realized some more and I was like, hang on a minute, this came out in 1939? 34, even earlier, 1934. This is around the time you did have kind of like a technology boom, especially in America. You had kind of industrialization becoming more of a thing. You had people making things on assembly lines. So big complicated tech was being made quicker and cheaper than ever. And it was being advertised a lot more. And a lot of these things were like, you know, you would see hoovers and dishwashers and refrigerators and, blah, and these were washing machines as well. These were all really heavily pushed towards women and housewives and um, you know, advertising was done towards women so they could spend their husband's money. That was how it was all set up and how it was done. And I started realizing that even though I first read this and thought, oh, great, they're encouraging like, you know, efficiency and blah, blah. I was like, no, actually, they're just trying to sell more products. This is like a product of capitalism. This is people trying to get people to spend more money on electronics and tech by saying like, oh, you need to use these things if you want to be a good housewife. Capitalism. And here's what a good wife and mother needs to do for her kids and husband. You must face death to bring children into the world. She must raise them, care for them, and pilot them safely to the threshold of manhood and womanhood. To her husband, she must be a companion, a sweetheart, a wife, and a mother. She must stir his ambition, pull him through fear, and keep success from hurting him. God, they're not really asking for much, are they? Honestly though, I read this stuff and it wouldn't be out of place in like a classically Abby video. I can literally see her quoting this stuff for word for word about how, as a wife, we must stir our husband's ambition and pull him through fear. These are things a transformed wife would say. These are things that I'm pretty sure Debbie Pearl has said. Classically Abby, Paul and Morgan, all of it. It's just, it's interesting how their talking points haven't changed in the last what is it, 80 odd years? 90 years, oh God, we're old. Where's all the time gone? Okay, and finally, this is the video that I really, really wanna focus on in this video. This is the one that I wanna spend the most time on because this is fantastic. This is called Year 1999 AD and it was made in 1967 and it's a look at, and I quote, what the 1999 house of tomorrow will look like. I love this so much. So it opens with this creepy sci-fi type music and opening with this kid building a sandcastle and being like, ah, oh, yes, this is a typical home. There will be a computer, a schoolroom, a health center for daddy. And then shock horror, the mother's like 40 years old and that isn't old. Um, because apparently 40 was considered old in the 60s. Um, and then the shock reveal is that this is actually 1999. It's brilliant, watch this. Again, so melodramatic. I love it. What are you building, Jamie? It's our house. Can't you tell? Yes. That's the center where I go to school. Yes. That's where the computer lives, and where I go to sleep, and where you and Daddy sleep. And where we go to swim, and where we see the ball game. And the symphony. The bath court. Right. And there's one more, the health center. Where Daddy exercises is measured? Right. How does the computer know everything? I mean like, I mean like how many times to exercise and all. I haven't the faintest notion. That's just too much for your old mother to understand. Old? You're not so old. Well, I'll be 44 next year. That's not so old. Not anymore. What year is it now? I forgot. Here, I'll show you. 
I love how camp this all is. And I just, I love this concept in general. Um, so one of my favorite things is looking back at old films and books to see what they thought the future would look like, especially when their idea of the future is basically either our past or our present. You know, I think it's great. As a kid, I used to collect a lot of old annuals and stuff. So I've spoken before, I had like Bunty annuals, Barbie ones, Twinkle, Rupert. And I used to go around all the little charity shops in Barnsley and like see what I could find cheap, you know, just like picking up little books here and there for like 20p, 50p, that sort of thing. Loved it. Still do it actually. I still have my collections of books, <laughs> my old annuals and stuff, especially Bunty. I still collect a lot of them. Beside the point, I have this vivid memory of this one book and it was some sort of Disney annual with like a white cover and a cartoon on the front and I had quite a few of them from over the years and there was one that might have been from like the 70s or 80s which had a segment on what the world would look like in the year 2000 and I was reading this obviously past the year 2000 and it was full of this amazing ridiculous stuff like how we'd be farming on the moon and sending it back down via big conveyor belts and how all the cars would be hover cars and stuff like that it was great and I seriously loved it it was brilliant. That's basically what this short film is. It's like I say made in 1967 about what they thought the world would look like for the average family in 1999. Now I'm also gonna add again this is a white middle class family so bear that in mind. We get no diversity, we get no look at the working classes, none of it, but it's still interesting, it's fun. I hope you'll have a giggle at this along with me because it's great. 1999 AD more than a generation away. And yet dreams travel faster than light. How will they live? Perhaps in a honeycombed structure like this, the oldest, strongest natural shape known. Hexagon modules that grow with a family's size and interests. So they could not have been more off with this, could they? No, it's more like, and especially in the 90s, we just ended up with big tower blocks that got taller and taller, and that's kind of what we still do today, because it is more efficient to build upwards than outwards, especially in overpopulated countries or places where there's not really that much land compared to population size, population dense places. That's one word I'm looking for, um, like in the UK. And besides, even if you can build outwards, sometimes you shouldn't. It is better to build up because we need to keep green and open spaces. It's really, really important for the environment. It's really important for the animals and plants that live there. Um, honestly, this idea of honeycomb buildings, you just keep adding new honeycombs to, or new hexagon shaped place building root of oh, words. The idea of honeycomb buildings that you just keep adding to honestly seems inefficient. And let's be honest, that would not work today and it would not have worked back in 1999. Michael Shaw, 45, husband, father, is an astrophysicist. Several days each week, he commutes to a distant laboratory where he's engaged in the Mars One project, the colonization of the first planet. His minor in the some 10 years he attended a Midwestern university was botany. It is one of his many continuing hobbies. I kind of love this actually. This reminds me of uh, The Martian by Andy Weir. I don't know if anyone's read that, but I just read it last month and I was surprised by how much I enjoyed that book. It was fantastic. I am not really a huge sci-fi fan. I normally, I prefer fantasy and that sort of thing, uh, but I picked it up on a whim because I'd heard like, really good things about it and I was like, I'll just read like two chapters and see what I think. And I was hooked and I just like smashed through the whole thing, loved the book. I loved the science elements to it. I was really like genuinely caring about the characters. I loved how it was written. I thought it was great. Anyway, so this, this guy in this video reminds me of the main character from The Martian. And yeah, to be fair, if you're gonna be part of a colonization program, a botanist is one of the people you're gonna want, or rather like, you know, an astrophysicist or an engineer or someone like that who is also trained in botany. That said, <laughs> the idea that in 1999, we'd be working on a Mars colonization program seems a little ambitious. But at the time they were working towards putting man on the moon, so maybe they thought it would be like, oh, everything will just blow up from here, right? But we'll talk a little bit more about the moon stuff in a bit because that's a great little reference to that. Yeah, the idea of colonizing Mars in 1999, looking back now seems a bit silly. And I think maybe we can be a little bit more realistic with timescales and stuff now, but hey, maybe it's something that will happen or start to happen or we'll get towards in the next hundred years or so. That is a possibility, I guess. Depends how important people deem it, really, doesn't it? 
This is one of the many 21st century devices or appliances that are part of the everyday life of the Shaw family. This workbench with its electronic screen enables Michael to call up photographic sections of the two parent fruit trees from which he began his experiments three years ago. All right, you know, all this stuff with, they call them photo screens, they do this a lot, they call them photo screens, but essentially computers and computer monitors, right? Honestly, not so far off from what we had in 99. We did have pretty similar tech then, maybe in some ways even more advanced than what we're seeing here, to be honest. Probably not as big, and it definitely wouldn't have been affordable for the average family, especially not working class families, but I'd say a fancy astrophysicist and botanist in 1999 would probably would most likely have been able to afford a nice computer like this for their family. So yeah, not not so far off to be honest. I say all this, please remember, in 1999 I was six years old, so my memories of that time are a little blurry and maybe a little out of order, but I'm doing the best I can. At that time, he stored the two photographic images in the central home computer, which is secretary, librarian, banker, teacher, medical technician, bridge partner, and all-around servant in this house of tomorrow. Yeah, actually, again, not too far off. Uh, with the whole Internet of Things boom in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, I'd say, people really do have smart homes now that are all connected up. You know, my sister has her doorbell camera that she can access from anywhere. She's got lights and stuff linked up so they turn on and off on timers and automatically and that sort of thing. She can access her in-home cameras to check on her cats from anywhere, anytime. My flat has a really cool thing where I can control the washing machine and dishwasher from my phone if I want to. It's great. So this sort of stuff, um, having a whole smart house all linked up together, maybe wasn't quite where we were at in 1999, but 10 years later, 20 years later, it's exactly where we are. So I'm going to say they were too far off. I think they did a pretty good job with this prediction, you know? Master James Shaw, eight years old, student, attends formal school two mornings a week. Much of his education, however, is carried on in a kind of education centre within the home. <laughs> okay, okay. This is where things are like a little... Uh, okay. Um, sure, the tech might have been there in the 90s to do this, and the tech is there today, but we cannot overlook the importance of socialisation in school. That interaction with kids, the daily socialisation, can be a really, really important thing for kids. Also, it was hell for a lot of us who were bullied, but <laughs> I still think it's important to be around other people and you can't just expect kids to do online school stuff from home all the time. They were definitely right in their prediction that tech would become a bigger part of education, but I think they forgot that the human element still matters. I think they forgot that kids still want that playtime with other kids and, you know, they need the interaction one-on-one -on -one with teachers and that sort of thing. Back in 99, we weren't quite this advanced yet, I don't think. Uh, we were still using, you know, like overhead projectors with handwritten slides, but tech was becoming more common. We had videos that we watched to get us prepared for our SATs exams. Uh, we were learning how to use Word on school computers. We were playing Crystal Rainforest as a class. I loved that game. Did anyone else play Crystal Rainforest? Please tell me you remember it because it was amazing. This is the last remaining forest on Oglo. It is in the kingdom of Azom. Here is a member of the Cut and Run gang. Now you are in trouble. You have been saved by something. And so, an era that began 500 years earlier with Copernicus and Galileo ends as the first astronaut takes his first halting steps onto the shores of the moon and begins a new age of man. This is the moon bit that I was referring to and I quite like that they included this because it's not too far from what the actual moon landing looked like and the actual moon landing happened just two years after this film was made so I thought it was quite fun that they included this and it's like a nice little, I don't know, nice little thing for us in the future. Okay. 
computers in 1999 were gonna be brutal. <laughs> God's sake. Cruel. <laughs> Poor kid. This is lecture 102. Galileo's life work, and indeed his personal character, can perhaps be exemplified by describing one of his early experiments. Yeah, but seriously, just keep watching these scenes. This does not look like a happy kid who's enjoying learning, does he? And, come on, has whoever made this ever met a child? There is no way an eight-year-old in any year, 1967, 1999, 2023, there is no way an eight-year-old would be this responsible for their own education and just follow these instructions of this, 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 and do it all themselves off their own back. No, a kid today would be rolling around on the floor, like watching YouTube videos and, you know, trying to play on apps on his phone and all, like if he wouldn't be responsible for his own schooling. There is no, no way. I think just look at how many kids struggled over lockdown and with COVID when it came to having to do all their school stuff at home. A lot of it was online lessons. A lot of it was like pre-recorded lectures. A lot of it were, they were being taught stuff over Zoom. There was no real face-to-face -face interaction. And a lot of kids suffered because they weren't learning the material properly. They weren't motivated enough to do the work themselves in their own time. They didn't have anyone giving them any real structure. And that's why so many kids did fall behind and things got so hard for them. And it's also why a lot of kids struggle now with issues to do with agoraphobia and um, struggling with social interactions and stuff like that because they missed out on some really important formative years in terms of socialization and schooling and that sort of thing. So while I get that this video is trying to push, hey, we have the tech to do this, I don't think they stop to think, yeah, but should we? Okay, and now let's have a look at how they thought meals would be prepared. Karen Ann Shaw, 43, wife, mother, part-time homemaker. Hey, mom, I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. How about lunch? How about two minutes? Okay, two minutes and counting. Luncheon is served. <laughs> <laughs> Split second lunches, color keyed disposable dishes, all part of the instant society of tomorrow. <sighs> Why am I not living in this version of 1999? I would love to just be able to press a button and have food appear in like 30 seconds. Boo to whoever hasn't made this tech yet. Boo. Why are we still expected to cook food ourselves or ask other humans to do it for us? <laughs> I want a computer to instantly feed me. <laughs> to be fair, I guess in some ways we are like part way here, not so much in this aspect, but you know, we have things like meal replacement drinks and stuff now. So I guess we're kind of on the way to that. I know I, I love meal replacement drinks. I always keep a few bottles of like Y food stuff in my fridge because I struggle with eating. I don't really enjoy eating food. I find it difficult. In order to make sure I'm always getting like a good number of calories and nutrients a day, I always keep a bottle a couple of bottles of Y food in the fridge and I can just drink one when I need it, when I'm struggling to eat and stuff. So that's really helped me and that's great. But I guess in some ways we do kind of have this instant food thing and this like instant nutrient thing. It's just different to what they imagined. A society rich in leisure and taken for granted comforts. At the turn of the next century, most food will be stored frozen in individual portions. The computer will keep a running inventory on all foodstuffs and suggest daily menus based on the nutritional needs of the family. When the meal has been selected, the various portions are fed automatically into the microwave oven for a few seconds of de-thawing or warming. This bit could not have been further from the truth though, could it? I mean, like, sure. Well, um, again, it's complicated. So in the 90s, frozen and processed food was pretty popular. There was like so much frozen food in supermarkets, I remember. The frozen freezer aisles were just they were like the biggest part of any supermarket. And I think I think frozen food in particular was very popular amongst us working classes who couldn't really afford much else. It was convenient for people who were working long hours. It was cheap. You could just throw things in the oven and then give it to your kids. You know, it made sense. But then from like the 2000s onwards, there started to be this big pushback against processed foods and frozen foods and how parents were killing their kids and that sort of thing. Like literally you had TV programs like Honey, We're Killing the Kids. 
seriously. But then you also have people come along like Jamie Oliver and his war on frozen food and turkey Twizzlers. We all remember that, right? So I think it's interesting that they were kind of almost romanticizing processed food here, whereas in the real world, once processed food became common, there was a lot of pushback against it. Interesting. The house of 1999 will be virtually maintenance-free. A central atmospheric system will maintain constant year-around temperatures and control humidity, bacteria, pollen, and dust. Oh, I wish this was the case. Again, how do I live in this 1999 home? Clothing of the non-disposable variety will be stored in cleaning closets, where a chemical vapor atmosphere and an ultrasonic vibrator will remove dirt particles. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this. I kind of hate it, the idea of a cleaning closet. So you just shove all the clean and dirty clothes in together and then just pump chemicals at them? Like, for how long? Is it going all the time? I, mm, this doesn't sound very energy efficient and it sounds like it would be expensive. Fingertip shopping will be one of the many homemakers' conveniences. Oh, this one they got pretty spot on though, this, I like this. Online shopping was starting to get really big in the 90s, so they got this right, they kind of got the timeline right, love it. But they missed the mark on exactly how it would work. <laughs> Listen to this, because it's quite funny. This video console will be channeled into the store of her choice. There, a camera will scan a display of wares, which she will select by push button. And then they just have to throw a little bit of sexism in, don't they? What the wife selects on her console will be paid for by the husband at his counterpart console. All bills and transactions will be carried out electronically. A central bank computer will debit the family's account the amount of purchases and credit the department store, for example, informing the family's home computer at the same time. The thing is, we can look at this now and realize how ridiculous this is because in 2023, we do take for granted the fact that us women are allowed to have our own money. This absolutely wasn't always the case and it's not the case still in some countries around the world. When this was made in 1967, the idea of women having their own money was still very new and alien to a lot of people. Women weren't allowed to have their own bank accounts in America until the 60s. It varied exactly when, state by state, but even then, in the 60s, like I say, most banks didn't allow women to apply for credit or loans, women couldn't apply for mortgages in America until 1974. Over in the UK, women weren't allowed their own bank accounts until 1975. So it's easy to understand why something made in 1967 didn't focus on women having their own money. But isn't it interesting how when they think about the future, they can dream up all this amazing tech and you'll be able to do this and this and this and this, but they couldn't possibly dream up a future where a woman had her, her, her own money. The money was still the man's, his bank account, his money, he had to approve the purchases. Isn't it crazy that they can dream up so much for the future? But women's independence, too far. Don't be silly. Nah. Father, at the touch of a button, receives an instantaneous printed copy of his budget, the amount of taxes he owes, the payments left on the car, and so forth. All documents and household records are available on the video screen for immediate reference. This was a great job predicting online banking though, like I personally love online banking. I would say online banking didn't really come into its own until probably around 20, uh, maybe 2010, 2012, somewhere around that time, so a little off with the dates, but only by 10 years, that's fine. But like I say, I love online banking, it makes everything so much easier, love it. And look at this, they predicted email, but worse. Also at his disposal, is an electronic correspondence machine, or home post office, which allows for instant written communication between individuals anywhere in the world. Remember, again, this was made in 1967. Email wasn't invented until 1971, but didn't really gain widespread popularity until when? The 90s. 
So they were pretty spot on with their predictions. I find it interesting how they thought the messages would be handwritten and not typed. You'll notice in this, no keyboards anywhere. Everything is done by dials. There's a couple of buttons here and there, but no keyboards, which is very, very interesting. Then there's some stuff about a health center, which can do full body scans and tell you exactly how much you need to exercise and stuff like that. As part of his everyday regime, Michael Shaw enters this home health center. He lies for perhaps 15 seconds on a kind of medical couch. His weight, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and electrocardiogram are routinely recorded. At the same time, his body is scanned for any isolated temperature pockets that signal oncoming disease or a localized infection. At the end of the examination period, the computer calculates the amount of exercise necessary to balance Mike's food intake and maintain proper muscle tone. That was kind of interesting, but again, completely off from anything we even have today, really, especially something that would be like in your home. There's stuff about 3D videos, a kid playing chess against a computer. So that was pretty spot on. There's a bit where like this family has friends over and one of them's like, oh, this 3D video is great. You need to get me a dupe of that. And I was like, oh, not copy, a dupe. Recorded a great new singer down San Juan way the other night. Would you like to see him? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, would you? Would you make me a dupe of that? I'd like to show it to some friends of ours who spend a lot of time down there. Sure, well, I guess you want in 3D, huh? Yeah, we finally made the switch. You gotta keep up with the times, you know. And then it got me thinking about, like, I wonder when things like, you know, copy and paste and stuff like that. I do wonder when that became more of, like, a mainstream phrase to use and stuff like that. I don't know. Anyway some interesting stuff but that is where i'm gonna end this video today again thank you for watching thank you for your time uh, i hope you enjoyed this i just thought it would be interesting to have a look at some of this stuff and discuss it and i'm very excited to hear your thoughts for it down in the comments below if you're new here it would be wonderful if you want to subscribe and um, if you like this video please leave a like or a comment because that really really helps with engagement feel free to share this video around on social media if you enjoyed it if you want to check out my new merch it's available in my merch store now i got some really really cool designs that are all made from paintings that i've done myself and i'm really really happy with them i love them and it would be great if you want to check them out uh but yeah for now thank you so much for watching today thank you for your time i appreciate you a lot and i'll see you again very very soon